let's do that. Um, so welcome everyone to uh, the third webinar in our series about um, AirSkin and fanciless robotics in general. Um, my name is uh, Andreas Baldinger. I will be your uh, speaker today, um, your expert uh, on AirSkin and uh, fanciless robotics. Why I can be the expert on AirSkin is quite easy because I helped build it, develop it, and now I'm the CEO of uh, Blue Danube Robotics, which is the company that um, developed, patented, and now produces and markets AirSkin. Um, you can you will you can all get uh, a handout of the presentation later. So my contact details are in there, and you of course you can contact me after the webinar. Um, so the idea for this webinar is that now 50% of this approximately an hour, um, uh, I will present to you um, about uh, Airskin versus Cobots. And then uh, we have time for questions if those arise and we discuss them um, directly. Um, so this is our third webinar in our webinar series. Uh, the first one was beyond 250 millimeters by my um, founding colleague, uh, Dr. Walter Wolkinger. Um, you can uh, access it on our YouTube channel. Um, the second one was from my other founding uh, colleague, our CTO, um, Dr. Michael Zillig, about for force measurement for risk assessment and how that actually works in the end. So not just the theoretical stuff, but how do you do the force measurements for risk analysis for robots that have uh, are used fences? And now here we talk about uh, how AirSkin um, lines up against the cobots on the market. And uh, I will be uh, your speaker today. And I'm not a PhD. I'm sorry. I hope it's okay. I'm a master in automation and control. Um, uh, but I'm in the company, I've been in the company for nine years now. Um, and to make this sure, we don't, we see it less as airskin or cobots. So either or decision. Um, and I'm not going to present it that way, but it's more like a, which to use when. I think that most, um, uh, most companies and most products have a space in the huge market of industrial automation. And the question is more about um, who has, uh, which product has its own specialties where. Um, so short introduction into our company. So AirSkin is a product of Blue Danube Robotics. Um, and we are the experts in fanciless robotics. We see us that way. Why? Um, because it's not one topic of several in our company and in our team but it's our main topic all year and for every employee. Each and every employee in our company knows about fences robotics, knows about what that entails and how we can achieve the best productivity for our customers. Um, we think about uh, productive, very important fences applications every day. And we have seen all kinds of good and really bad solutions um, in the industry. And we believe based on that knowledge that um, we can, our customers can achieve the highest flexibility with our patented solution, Airskin. We were founded in 2013 as a spin-off of the Vienna University of Technology by me and three of my colleagues of the um, research group Vision for Robotics. And since 2018, we have strategic VC funding um, backing us. Uh, we have our headquarters and production site in the industrial district of Vienna, so north of Vienna. And at the current moment, we have uh, 28 employees, but are uh, on the look uh, for two more. So we're looking for a product manager right now and a sales manager because we are growing rapidly. So our vision um, is a fanciless world for robots. Why? Why do we need a fanciless word for robots? It's pretty easy. If you look at that picture, that's not done by us, but that's just an example done by Audi. Um, and if you look at all the big 
car manufacturers in the world and also the robotic research groups, the, the big FMCG companies like Unilever, um, P&G, Johnson & Johnson, or the tier one companies like, let's say, uh, Continental. If you look at them, all of those companies have a somewhat similar um, vision for the future. And that's without fences. You can see any fences in that picture. Why? Because if you build your production layout without fences, you have a lot of added benefits afterwards. You have open and flexible production layouts. And that means that you can react way faster and smarter to changes in your production flow. And you can rearrange your production flow and re rearrange your production flow uh, based on uh, daily business. Um, so is there, uh, when we talk about numbers, is, does that also back up that trend? Yes, it does. There has been a trend towards collaboration, but let's say more in a grand scheme, fancelessness, um, because the share of so-called collaborative robots, cobots, um, has been growing faster and faster over the last years. Um, if we look at the annual installations on collaborative robots on the right side, you can see that even if the total industrial robot installations, which the cobots are a part of, even if those fluctuate, the share, which is collaborative robots, um, increase every year. Um, the last week, um, the International Federation of Robots published the preliminary results of 2021. And we can see that there's a huge jump in the sales of industrial robots um, from 2020 to 2021, a jump of 27%. Um, they did not uh, share the actual numbers for the cobots yet, but we know that they estimate around 31,000. Um, collaborative robots sold in 2021, and that would be a growth of 41% to a share of 6.4% of the whole market. So the share grows every year, not, not the numbers themselves, but even the share of the market grows. Um, so why are collaborative robots sold more and more? Because we can see over the last five years that there's a more than 30% growth per year averaged over the years. Um, so we looked at, and others did too, we looked at the reasons why do companies decide to buy um, collaborative robots in the beginning. And you find out that actually less than 5% want to use them and in the end do use them as in collaborative use, which means um, working directly, not next to, but with the worker. 50%, um, about half, of the, the cobot buyers um, buy them because they are easy to use, they're easy to program. You don't have to have um, prior knowledge about robot programming or not that uh, high amount of knowledge compared to normal industrial robots. But the vast share of those decide to buy a collaborative robot because they want to have it fanceless and it's more than 70%. So what happens if, if people buy cobots because they want to use the fences, but in the end they find out that it's not safe enough? You can see in the picture. So uh, then what happens is the robot get encased behind the fence later. No one wants that. That's, that's, no one in the industry wants that, and not the manufacturer of the cobots and not the, the users. So the real demand in the market is not for collaboration, but it's actually for fencelessness. Why? Because you can save floor space of up to 90% in a lot of examples we have. You, you can use the flexibility to use the robot between different workplaces, set it up easy, quick, um, and you have an uh, open production layout. So you can rearrange your product flow easier. So the question is not about collaboration, but about fencelessness. And the fenceless applications are actually a spectrum. It's not about collaboration. Um, on itself. So on the left side in this graph, you can see the normal separate workspaces we know from robotics up till, let's say, 10 years ago. Um, there's maximum speed, full automation, no contact allowed, no contact um, wished for. And then, but then you have coexistence where you work side by side, but without any fences. So it's already easier, but you don't really have a uh, a shared workspace. 
you don't have like an area of the table where the worker and the robot work. That happens in cooperation. So they don't work with each other, but uh, sequential. Um, and then in the end, you have the, the highest level, let's say that's collaboration, where you work directly with the robot actually. Um, and if we look at Airskin now, why we say fanceless is because all of these are part of the Airskin world. And all of these are solved in the industry with Airskin. So the question is, how, how, can, how are the companies that build cobots and safety equipment, how are they um, doing that? So if we look at how can you achieve technically seen fencelessness? How can you use them without fences? So you have uh, your big group of possible technical robot safety solutions. And one, the biggest part, the earliest part in the beginning was the separating safety equipment. That's basically fences, um, uh, but also light curtains. It's uh, in the ISO 14, uh, 210. And then on the other big side is the non-separating safety equipment in the ISO 13, 849. So that means everything that's not separating the working space between the worker and the robot. Um, and the first is the most well-known, which is the sensitive safety equipment uh, in the IEC 62046, which is basically safety mats where you detect if a worker enters a, a room, uh, uh, an area, and also laser scanners. Then you have your fixed safety equipment, which is uh, dual hand acknowledgement switches. Um, and then the movable safety equipment, we all know the one hand acknowledgement switches or, or so-called dead man switches also. And then in green, we have this group of limiting safety equipment. Um, what is it limiting? It's basically limiting the force the robot can apply, limiting the speed, um, uh, limiting the pressure the robot can apply. And you can do that uh, in two ways, without touch occurring between work and robot and with touch occurring between those. So this is where cobots and other safety equipment then mentioned here is, uh, is at home. So the cobots are in that group. So what actually constitutes a cobot? Why is a cobot to build a certain way? Cobots are usually lightweight for low inertia. Um, why? Because the smaller the mass the robot has, the smaller the contact forces are on impact. So lightweight means higher speed. And you want to have smooth outer shapes without sharp features. Because with sharp features, you always have the, the problems with high pressure if you have a touch. And you want smooth outer shapes to prevent clamping and shearing when um, touching the robot or the, the robot touches the worker. Then you need some way of safety sensors to enable um, defenselessness and the collaboration. And predominantly, it has to be par integral part of the cobot and not built into the room, predominantly, but not exclusively. And of course, not necessarily, but it's mostly the case, cobots should be easy to use, easy to program, reprogram without any prior knowledge necessary. So how are these safety sensors now, the third point, how are they technologically built and what is the measurement uh, principle behind? So in the group of limiting safety equipment we had before, we have two branches without and with touch. And now we look at the without touch part. So the most well-known of those is capacitive and external uh, measurement. And you, most of you, I guess, know the Bosch APAS. So Bosch APAS stops before you touch it because it measures the electromagnetic field um, surrounding the parts of the robot. Then we have vision. And there's two parts. There's external vision built into the room on the roof or in the corners of the room. And then there's mounted vision onto the robot. The most well-known for external is VO Robotics. Um, and they already have applications up and running where you have cameras uh, placed strategically in the corners in the room and they measure basically the 3D um, scene in the room. And then you have the more you have the part of the mounted vision onto the robot. There are a lot of companies working on that, but there's no 
real contender, let's say, with a finished product on the market. Um, but basically what it does is it has distributed um, vision sensors on the robot in specific parts. So the vision moves with the robot. Then we have ultrasonic measurement without touch, which uh, where there is Misa, for example, a German company, which uh, provides solutions for end of arm tooling safety um, using ultrasonic sensors. Um, inductive is uh, a rather peculiar solution, but there are some. So for example, SIG provides uh, inductive safety sensors, which can be mounted onto the robot, but also be part of the applications. And then you have radar, and radar can also use like a laser scanner, but also mounted onto the robot. There are some uh, companies who try to do that. On the other branch uh, of the limiting safety equipment, we have with touch. So that's the, the bigger part. Um, the first one is mechanical, just a mechanical uh, measurement. Did I touch something or not? And the easiest to do that is with switches. Um, there was the company Misa who um, built uh, some prototypes, but it never went into full scale production of such a skin. And then you have serious elastic actuators, um, which uh, were deployed into the Baxter robot of Rethink Robotics. Um, on Without Touch, we had the, the external measurement of the capacitive field, uh, capacitive um, sensor of the electromagnetic field. You can also do that internally. And uh, one robot who does that, combined with the external uh, measurement, is uh, Komau with their robot Aura. But there's also the possibility to use piezo resistive foils, basically, where you measure the uh, resistance between. Um, one company who does that, uh, we get asked a lot about them, is a Taiwanese company, is uh, Touche Solutions, which is basically foils. When you touch it, um, you um, decrease or increase the resistance, and you measure that. Then there's the big group of torque sensing, torque sensors. And uh, two parts, you can build torque sensing into the joints and also in the base. And this green group we have here is what we all know as the cobots on the market. You can measure the torque in the sensors directly via a dedicated torque sensor, which is done, for example, in the KUKA LBR EVA. But you can also measure it indirectly by measuring the motor current and deriving at the, the torque in the joint um, that's uh, done in the universe robots. But there's also the possibility of measuring in the base. For that, you should use a force torque sensor. And that's done, for example, at the FANUC CR uh, cobot series. And of course, one way to to measure if touch occurs is via air pressure. And that's what AirSkin does. That's what we came up with as a solution. Why did we choose air pressure? Because using air pressure, we can uh, derive at a performance level E, category three, according to the ISO 13849. Um, because actually the, the sensor, the pad itself, um, measures every um, five millisecond if it's working or not. And everything is built redundantly into the sensor pads. Um, so air skin is a soft, thin, airtight skin cover, uh, cover. And there's a flexible dampening system underneath. And we have our smart safety electronics, which are basically the plug in the pad. So if a contact deformation occurs at the air skin, the inside pressure changes. Because you have a decrease of the volume, that means the pressure has to increase. And the barometric sensors, which are measuring inside and outside for, um, to, to compare these two, um, they detect the air pressure change and trigger an emergency stop. The air skin uh, safety sensor um, the sen uh, opens the switches and uh, in this way communicates to the robot controller that a touch occurs in maximum of 8.5 milliseconds. Um, so you can see in these two photos, on the one in the middle, you can see if the air skin is on, it's blue, the robot is moving, switches are closed. 
If you touch it, you deform, you increase the pressure, air skin stops, robot is stopped. So now that we know how air skin works and we know basically how cobots works, how do they compare? Um, the questions I get asked the most outside is why we, um, let's say, we just tell the world that, that with air skin, we can move that much faster. Um, it's, it's not just a PR and marketing message, but we also measure it uh, together with uh, external safety uh, experts in uh, Germany and other countries, uh, also with TÜV and also with companies like Pilz, for example, at customers. So on the cobot side, the reaction always uh, happens after the critical force is reached, because at first, the sensors on the inside of the robot have to measure that a torque deviation occurred. And you only have a torque deviation once after you applied your force. In comparison to that, the air skin reacts before the critical force is reached because the sensors are on the outside and they measure the contact directly, not the torque. So we measure the contact and the critical force is then reached after uh, air skin reacts. The cobots um, typically have a hard shell. A hard shell, even if it has smooth features, means that you have a small contact area. So your force is distributed over a smaller area. That means the surface pressure is also an issue when you talk about the permissible um, maximum speed of the system. Not just the force, but also the surface pressure. Compared to air skin, um, we have a soft shell. And that means that the contact area after the touch actually increases, you have a large contact area. And so the surface pressure in our applications never is an issue. The limiting factor is always just the force. Cobots want to have low masses because they are necessary to keep the forces low. Because from a physical standpoint, your torque deviation is directly linked to the mass of the robot. And that means that because you have a hard shell, there's an almost immediate transfer of the kinetic energy into your system, into your robot, and from the robot into your worker or your, your, your thing the robot uh, moved against. With air skin, high masses are possible because we don't measure the torque. We, there is no measurement through torque, but we measure the contact. And after the contact, the kinetic energy is absorbed with our soft structure in the pads themselves and underneath. So if we look at that now from, with a comparison, so we have done, I don't know how many tens of thousands of measurements over the last years, together with universities, together with, um, with certifying bodies, together with customers. And we derived at, uh, let's say, um, good comparison between those two. So if you look at the cobot, you see, if you look at the timeline underneath that you have a very almost immediate transfer of kinetic energy from the robot into your um, hindrance, into the, the object you bump. Um, when you look at the air skin, actually that's delayed and you have, because you have an absorption of kinetic energy. If you look at the peaks, air skin in our measurements normally is around one third of the, the peak force compared to a cobot. And it doesn't happen immediately, almost instantaneously, but it, it happens delayed because you have the contact, you, you, um, the robot system breaks, and then you have a more a slope um, creating the, um, the highest uh, impact force. Of course, this is zoomed in. So the whole graph is just, uh, um, 0 0.4 seconds. So that happens in an instant, but if you, you zoom in, you can see the difference. So if, you, if we look now at uh, a video demonstrating that, so here we have a, a Cybertech uh, KR20 um, um, with an air skin on. And uh, this is moving against uh, a slide uh, with weights on that uh, mimics and uh, free space um, impact. Um, something is, I'm sorry. So, okay. 
So we can see it deforms and it moves against it. But this is too fast. So we have it from another angle in um, slow motion. And I show it to you. It moves against, it deforms, air skin deforms, absorbs the energy. And if we look at it once more, you can see that the LEDs, the lights, the colors on the LEDs are indicating when the touch occurs. And then the stop signal is sent and you can see when it stops and how a lot of the energy of the impact energy is absorbed into air skin while the robot actually stops. So you can see here, you can see the lights changing, the robot stops and the absorption of the energy. You can also look at an example uh, of the Agilus. Here we used a uh, uh, KUKA KR10 Agilus uh, for this example. And here we have a speed of 1.6 meter per second moving against the slide. And you can, you can also see that there's a... It's not moving on my side right now. I, I hope you can see it moving. Dominic, did you see it? Yep. Okay, yep. good just on my side. So you can see how the robot moves against the, the, the measurement sensor, so the, the force sensor, and the air skin, how the air skin deforms and, and absorbs a lot of the energy on impact. Once more. So, it's nice that we absorb the energy, but why does that mean that you can move faster with the robot when using Airskin? It's about the regulation stated in the ISO 10 to 18. Former, it was the ISO TS 15066. It's now included in the 10 to 18. And that provides the biomechanic limits for different uh, body regions. So we test for different body regions in those tests. Um, the force, for example, if you have a 116 uh, Newton um, limit, uh, as force for the lower arms and the wrist joints. Um, that's air skin reacts at five newtons and it dampens the collision. Uh, collision. And on the pressure side, um, we never had the issue in any application so far where the, the robot, as, let's say not the, not the end of arm tooling or the grip where the customers built themselves, but where the robot or the safety flange or the, the, the air skin pads were an issue when it came to, to the surface pressure. That was always excluded. Um, you may know that you have two different types of contact. You have the dynamic contact in free space, where our last measurements showed that we can reach 1.6 meter per second TCP speed. Um, and those permissible speed is, uh, speeds are calculated with a formula in the norm and also now can be validated with measurement equipment um, like you saw in the video just before. And then you have the quasi-static quasi um, contacts, the clamping, crushing. Um, there we, we have like a, um, a rule of thumb. Uh, if the application is built uh, proper, um, with air skin, you can reach up to 400 millimeters per second. And uh, all those of you who already built uh, collaborative applications when it comes to clamping, think can uh, think know uh, what that means to have 400 millimeters per second in the end of the movement. Um, it depends also on the stopping distance of the robot, of course, and the, the air skin thickness. Um, so now we know what uh, Airskin is capable of. Um, but you may think that uh, I still want to have what uh, cobots offer me. So what we do is we show that uh, with Airskin and industrial robots, you have the best of two worlds. You can be fences with Airskin because you can take all the benefits you have from the industrial robots, which is speed, payload, reach, the precision, the accuracy, the durability of the system over several years, even, years, even de decades in some cases. And 
you put on uh, you you include air skin into the application and you have the benefits of a fanceless robot which is you don't have any fences you don't have to build them up you you save floor space you can put the robots closer together which we had some cases of and also the flexibility to use different workspaces and so we derive at fences applications productive fences applications in the market because we use the best of these two worlds but most of you may say, yeah, okay, but the robot is just, the robot safety is just 20% of the solution for my problems. Uh, we know um, a big part of that is actually the safety for the end of arm tooling and also for the work tool and also the work object. Um, and this is actually where our strengths will really, really come into play because over the last uh, six to seven years, we thought about the safety for tools for work objects themselves. Um, so if your end of arm tooling and your work object doesn't have any sharp edges, it's pretty easy because with uh, Airskin safety flange, you can see on the top row, the three pictures, we have a universal end of arm tooling safety compliant robotic collision sensor. Long word, uh, a lot of adjectives. Uh, with performance level E and category three that gives way in the translatory axis and it also tilts. Um, if this is not enough, because you have sharp uh, objects or you have a, a different kind of gripper that has sharp edges, edges um, we, we have the airskin modules, which is basically some kind of Lego for performance level E safety. Uh, and you can build it around the objects. They all fit together into one flexible solution. And we can also um, make uh, lot size one industrial grade airskin pads for special cameras, um, tactile measurements and such things. Um, you can also see um, in this video how this all plays together. So this is from um, last year and uh, palletizing application with the Cybertech KR20. And uh, there's uh, two suction grippers. Um, they have air skin pads on, and they have uh, air skin safety flange on the safety flange for, um, for up to 20 kilogram of dynamic uh, weight. In static weights, we uh, increased it up to 30 kilograms. Um, or not that high dynamic. And uh, in this example, you can see if, if you touch the, just the box and not the, any air skin pad, it stops. You can also touch the robot, you can touch the air skin pads on the device. And it also here where the hand gets crushed between two, two pallets, uh, between two boxes the system stops immediately. So to sum up, what do we offer with uh, AirSkin compared to uh, the market is number one, of course, the speed. That's our biggest uh, reason where why customers uh, derive at solutions with AirSkin is that we can use the robot in 1.6 meter per second in free space, of course, depending on the application itself, but we try to consult our customers and to help them achieve the highest uh, permissible speed and also 400 millimeters per second when it comes to clamping. We have the flexibility to use industrial robots uh, in one application, but for several production lines, you can move the robots depending on your peaks of uh, production uh, during the days or during the week. Um, we have up to 90% of uh, floor space reduction. Um, and we have a simplified uh, risk assessment because we provide um, all the safety concepts for the robots together with the air skin already to our customers. And we have the highest safety for a safety sensor for collaboration on the market with a PLE category three. So thank you very much for listening uh, to my talk. I hope I could give you uh, a better understanding of why we, we derive at that speed um, in real life applications in the industry. 
And if you have any questions now, um, please feel free to ask and I will answer them to the best of my knowledge. Thank you. Okay, no questions. Yeah, hello, this is Volker Meitz speaking from Airbus in Hamburg. Of course, um, technically, um, very good speech, I, uh, easy to understand. Um, uh, the main topic against uh, next to, um, yeah, to, to technical things is the cost. Uh, yeah. Um, normally, an airskin, when we talk about a collaborative uh, for a ro whole robot, it's around third of the cost of the robot. Purchasing cost of one standard robot. Yeah. For example, if you if you buy a KUKA Agilus from KUKA, then the, the air skin on top is uh, normally a third of that. Um, when it comes to applications, um, of course, if we have to develop um, lot size one pads, for example, we have to look at the complexity. But even if we talk about very complex end of arm tools, um, with development and everything, it's normally under 10,000 euros for the custom made. I mean, the biggest grippers we had were um, 800 times 600 millimeters. But that's okay. a rough estimate, yeah. Okay. Second question is, um, where, where do you implement your signals into the um, um, robot? controls or to the standard PLC of the system? Um, technically speaking, you can do with it whatever you like, because um, what we are is, uh, is kind of an OSSD. So that means we are, it switches, it's redundant switches opening and closing. Um, we even had some crazy applications where they turned on and off the light with it. For the, the off the shelf products we offer for, let's say the KUKA, um, Agilos or the Stäubli takes to touch. Um, they, are, they have proprietary connectors and directly plug into the controller. But because in most applications, you don't, you don't just have your controller and your robot and your gripper, but you have everything around, the feeding, the, um, uh, the different sensors and everything. So you, in most cases, they, you use a safety PLC and there you can, uh, connect uh, Airskin, of course, directly to the safety PLC. We even offer a uh, Siemens Simatic already uh, pre-configured with the Airskin. And there, um, if we use a safety PLC, normally we use uh, Provinet with Provisafe um, to connect to the controller. Okay, and um, if I see the KUKA robot, so you have a lot of safety cushions there. If one of them is broken, it has a malfunction, yep. what is the workaround? So normally the whole system will stop? Or... Yes, the whole system has to stop um, because one, one of the pads is, is missing. Um, what we have there is the magnets are mounted onto the robot. I mean, all our airskin pads are mounted via magnets. So we have the mounting magnets, which uh, adjust it and hold it in place, even if uh, they hold up to 15 G. So even if you have a full stop with full speed, they're not going to flow through the production facility, but they're going to stay on. Uh, and we have the electrical connectors also with magnets. So in the end, what you do is you have spare pads on the side if, if the customer wants it, and they can just take off the pad, put a new one on. Then we have a setup button that's already integrated in the connection box that's, uh, that connects the proprietary wiring of the airskin to your controller or the, the robot controller, the PLC or the controller. And you just make a setup that takes five seconds and it's up and running because the, the pads themselves, each, each Airskin pad is a unique safety sensor, but uh, they work in unison. So they uh, talk over the, uh, the safety signals. So they see if some, uh, one of those is missing or a false one got implemented. So what we also offer is a spare part kit so there's uh, for the maintenance guys um, in applications where they have a lot of, let's say, issues, 
because most issues we had with broken pads were three parts, uh, three kinds. The first one, a forklift driving against the robot. I can't do anything against that. The second one is a knife or in most cases, a screwdriver going into the pad. So the puncture. And the third one is if they reprogram the application, leave the air skin on and just uh, move it against the pillar in the um, production facility. I mean, that's gonna damage it. And then you can just replace the pads and uh, works again. Did that answer the question? Yes, for sure. So uh, one last question is, oh, so two questions at least, uh, um, yeah, lead time for for one set, yeah. for any set, so roughly. I mean, and in the, in, yeah. The second, uh, just the second is um, uh, related to, to the topic before. In, in the delivery, is there an analyzer software included so that I can check via the HMI which pad is broken or is it just by light or? Okay, um, the second one is easy, that's just by light because the, the broken pad, there are um, um, LED, status LEDs built inside the pads. So they, they light from, from the inside and blue one is run up and running. Uh, and for example, red is an error and then you, you just exchange it. So the pad itself tells you if it's this, this pad has a problem or not. Um, and if the light is broken? Didn't happen yet. Um, if, if the light is broken, you know that it's the one pad that is broken. I mean, yes, we had a broken light, but that's actually when you drive with the forklift against it. And then you don't need any other indication that that pad is broken because it's completely damaged. It's destroyed. Um, your first question, lead time. When you look at the supply chain situation right now, our lead time is a fraction of all the um, lead times uh, provided by the robot manufacturers. And normally, if it's a standardized uh, air skin for, let's say, um, a KUKA Agilus, it's around uh, six weeks, six to eight weeks. It's, if it's just the modules, it's normally below two weeks. And if it's a customized solution, it depends on the complexity. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we had one question in the um, chat. It was about how we achieve redundancy for the pads. So one, as I said before, um, one pad itself is a fully functioning air skin. So the, we developed our safety system from the get-go, from the start with TÜV together. So we built our measuring principle, our, lay, uh, uh, our layout of the PCBs, our sensors, everything with redundancy. So everything in the system is redundant in itself. Um, so the pads themselves as a unit, everything inside is redundant. So you don't need any redundancy when it comes to two pads, let's say. Yeah. Does that, um, Mr. Shoai, does that answer the question? And if not, of course, you can contact me also later and we can talk about it into depth. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Um, yes, I have one question, um, yes. Andrea Schinemann speaking. Um, you showed us that you have also solutions to cover the end effector. Yes. Um, so how do you handle the situation if you have to change an end effector? Because at this moment, some of these pads are missing. Um, yeah. You, yeah, here. Um, if you change your gripper, you want to say if you change the layout of the gripper or you exchange the whole gripper? No, like, like a head change or like a tool change. I mean, we used AirSkin with uh, tool changes um, because if you let the PLC take part of the whole AirSkin and if you can wire the AirSkin actually through the uh, tool change uh, adapters, um, then you can have AirSkin on the tools in your um, inventory. And if it changes it and the PLC activates them, that works. If you want to exchange, let's say the gripper just enlarges, but it doesn't get exchanged uh, the whole gripper, then um, 
there are some uh, possibilities because the, the AirScan modules, um, they have a support layer underneath and then magnetically the pad connects and the support layer can be screwed on. So um, if we change- uh, We speak about an automatic change. Yeah, if, if you mean with uh, automatic tool change system, then AirScan does work with that, yeah. Mm, okay. Where, where, where the robot moves to the robot itself, the system exchanges its uh, the gripper. For example, it changes from a, a, a camera to a, a drill. Let's say. Yes. Drill is a good example for collaboration. So both both are covered with these pads. Yeah. So in the moment you lay down the camera, let me say that these pads are missing. So normally yes. the system could not move. Yes, but. You have to. You can put several airskin lines um, into one robot. So, um, for example, in the big robots with the Cybertech, we have four lines. Why? Because we we want to have one part of the airskin for the the lower arm, one part for the upper arm, one part for the elbow, one part for the um, for the wrist and the the whole um, gripper situation. So you could choose one lane for the gripper as we did because we had really big grippers before and if your plc is in control of your safety then you can say okay these of these two la lanes the one is still active and has to work the other one gets switched now so because uh, if your plc is the master of your safety you can find solutions to exchange that we've done that before okay by by using different links and using different safety inputs at the PLC. Okay. And another question, um, for example, we have a drilling application, and in this case, we have normally bigger cable changes for electrical device. Yep. Um, um, pneumatic uh, vacuum tubes. So, did you have a solution to handle these cable chains with the airskin pads? Um, yes, for the for the Agilus, we have the we have a solution where we use the Igus Triflex. I don't know if you know that. No. Um, so the the flex three D flexible um, uh, power chain for for cables on the outside. And we have mounting brackets that hold them into place. But if you touch, even if you touch the cable, you're gonna touch the airskin pad underneath. And uh, this way, at the Agilus, we can wire bigger uh, cable packets on the outside of the robot. With the CyberTech, you have uh, different solutions. With CyberTech, if it comes to a joint diameter of up to 40 millimeters, you can put everything actually through the airskin itself. So there is a uh, a dedicated um, dedicated um, cable st uh, structure underneath uh, the air scan where you where the, the customer can put their cables in and if it's too big um, we had that for example with uh, motor block screwing at Ford what they did is they they used um, um, from the top they just they just put the the, the cables from the top of the room down directly to the gripper because it was like this big of a cable okay. package yeah okay thank you you're welcome any more questions i mean you don't have to think too hard in that heat right now about any possible question or questions arising if you you think of one and you, uh, if you think of one later, you can contact me. You, have, uh, you, will, you will all receive um, the slide deck, the presentation, um, and uh, also the recording will be finished and put uh, onto YouTube. And uh, we will try to get it in time. So you will get with the, with the slide deck, you will also get the link uh, to the video. And in there you have my contact uh, details and you can reach me.
about any other questions. And of course, also at sales at airskin.io, you can reach our, um, our expert sales staff. So I want to thank you all for participating. And I, I hope I could give you an insight into our technology and how it compares. And um, I hope that you can could learn at least a teensy bit of new information today, because I'm also always uh, of the opinion that a good day is a day where I learn something new, even if, even if it's just a little bit. Maybe if you think the same. Um, I'm glad. Thank you for the talk. And I uh, wish you all the best for the remaining day. Thank you. And bye.